Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to First UMC of Hammond. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor here, and I am so glad that you have joined us this morning. If you may not recognize me right off top, uh, I was actually ordained in this haircut, so uh, I, while it might be a shock to you, the bishop approved, so uh, that uh, we're okay there. Uh, I'm so glad you've joined us. Whether you're joining us on Facebook or on Zoom, you can get together in the comments section, say hi to each other, reach out. It's a Great place to share joys and concerns when it comes time for that in the service. Uh, whether you're joining us by Facebook or Zoom or by uh, phone through Zoom, we are very happy you're here. If you're here on Facebook, would you hit the like and share buttons on this video? It helps us get this into as many eyeballs and onto as many devices as possible, which is, as I say, not the point, but it is not, not the point. As we move on with this morning, I'm going to turn your attention to the announcements page located inside your bulletin. Not a lot I'm going to go over with you this morning. I want to continue to invite everyone to join with us in our Lenten study called Embracing the Uncertain. This is a great find that Pat found for us. We meet Wednesdays during Lent at 7 p.m. Last week was uh, been a, a fantastic time of gathering and uh, sort of Setting Lent off on a, a, a good note, a, a positive note, a, a transformative note on you know, the reason we do, well, part of the reason we do Lent uh, anyway, but uh, that is Wednesdays during Lent, 7 p.m. If you need to get the book, uh, if you need help getting that, you can uh, talk to me. It is available on Amazon uh, through all sorts of booksellers as well. Uh, the February 2nd Mile Giving, this is your last Sunday for that, will be the uh, Learning League. And uh, Spring Plants for Easter may be ordered up until uh, March 21st. The cost is $10 per plant, and checks may be made payable to FUMC. Uh, I want to invite you all, uh, I want to continue to push the uh, new 830 drive-in worship service that we have here in the uh, parking lot of the church. You just Arrive at 8.30, turn your radios to 91.5, and we join together in a, in a more abbreviated worship service. I nearly went outside this morning because it was so much warmer, considering that two weeks ago we were essentially froze out. That I, I, was, uh, I was very, I, I was, in, you know, it's that, that in-between time where people in, you know, from the, the, you know, the snowy states will be just fine coming out of winter wearing short sleeves and that's so yeah uh almost did that this morning may do it next week who knows the only way to find out is to be there 8 30 sunday mornings and of course we are here 10 o'clock each sunday as well i'm gonna let you look through the rest of the bulletin and ask you to uh come with me as we go towards worship and join together in our call and response where i say oh lord open our lips and you respond and we shall declare your praise. Are you ready? O Lord, open our lips, and we shall declare your praise. O Lord, open our lips, and we shall declare your praise. O Lord, open our lips, and we shall declare your praise. Now let us join together and sing our opening song, as long as I can get the uke up. Great is thy faithfulness, beginning to end.
for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside beginning to end my life in your hands great great is your faithfulness you never let go this one thing i know great great is your faithfulness beginning to end my life in your hands great great is your Oh, oh, great, great is your faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Good morning. We celebrate you, awesome God, for you are on the move in the world and in our lives. You are joyful in the dance of creation. All things are made and made new by your word. You are gracious in your providing for us, in the warmth of home and hearth and daily bread. You are gentle in your tending to us, to our wounds, our needs, our faults, and our failures. And you are resolute in your march towards Jerusalem, determined to do what must be done. How can we thank you? Let our worship be our thanks. Amen. Man is made for loving, not buying. Hey, it's Mr. Mike here. Um, I just got home from work, and I'm going to try something a little bit different today. I'm going to show you something. Um, I'm in my van here. Uh, let me try to grab my lunch box here. Now, normally when I would go home, I would go up to the stop sign up there, go right, and then about half a block up is where I live. Well, there's no street there anymore. It's all construction and so I'm having the park down at the end of the block and walk through um, this alley um I think you probably saw the other video when um you saw we would park our cars on the side of the house where the grass is now I, I don't um always show these in order um today I am recording this it is February 2nd Groundhog Day and so if you remember, um, it was two days ago from when we recorded this, um, January 31st, on that Sunday, we woke up to a foot of snow on the ground. And my cars were all stuck in the yard. And we had to call tow trucks to get our vehicles out. And so now, because we have no place else to park, we are having to park about a half a block down the road from us and having to walk through this alley through the back here in order to get home. Yes, it is a little frustrating. It's a little inconvenient. Um, it's not anything I'm too happy about, but you know something, um, one thing is complaining is not going to do anything and two, one of the things is, is even with all of this inconvenience and with the road construction and all this we're going through, 
I will still choose to um, look at all of the blessings that we still have in our life. I mean, there are two drivers in our in our household, and we own three vehicles, and we both um wake up to have um um work to go to when when COVID hit. A lot of people um lost their jobs or couldn't go go there anymore. And Penny and I, we are considered essential workers. Yeah, you can see my car um right there. That, that thing is stuck until the snow melts. That thing is not coming out. But yeah, Penny works in the medical field. Um, so she's actually been working even more hours um, since all of this hit. I am what I'm um, considered, I, I, I like these, um, I got some fancy words. I am considered um, critical infrastructure supply chain. Uh, with, 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 you know, basically, we, we supply parts to build machines and stuff like that. So, you know, we both have a job to go to. Um, it's still nice that we have a place to call home. So after that long walk, I get to go inside and warm up a, a little bit. And if my shoes, um, you know, walk through this, my shoes will get wet, my socks will get wet. I can just go inside and change out of my shoes and change out of, uh, put on some dry socks. So yeah, there are, in all this, yeah, let's, let's, let's take, take a look at this. I'm, Normally, if I'm walking at this would be um concrete here. Normally, I would um we'd be parking here, but here is what our front looks like. Where these yellow things are, this would be a sidewalk. You got the construction guys down there working. It is supposed to be like this until at least next October, if, if not later. And you know, it, it's some more blessings are um. Next time it was predicted to snow, we're just gonna stay at my mom's house. Um, so we don't have to worry about getting stuck. So yeah, yeah with, 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 with all this inconvenience and with all of this that we're having to go through, there are just still so many blessings um, in, in our life that if you stay positive and you look more for what you have and not what you don't have, you will live life so much happier. You will live life so much more like Jesus would want you to. Let's pray. Lord, among all the hassles, among all this inconvenience, I still want to thank you for all of the blessings that you give um, Penny and I and Keelan. We might not have a lot, but what we have is blessings that we thank you for each and every day and pray that they will keep coming. And all the God's children sing. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you.
Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. As you are joining us online and in the comment section, we invite you in this time of prayer to share your joys and concerns. I want to bring up a couple right now. I will let you look through the uh, uh, bulletin for the prayer concerns. Uh, Susan Bravo sent this to me. Nancy and Fred Elias of Clovis, California, lost their son, Chris, to COVID. He had been hospitalized since December. So let us lift the Clovis and the rest of the... Uh, uh, Bravo family in prayer and uh, would also like to lift up, I want to thank uh, Donna Bifus for letting me know, uh, Burl Puckering has had a stroke. Uh, let me, uh, I just want to make sure that that was, um, it, I, it was in between and I wanted to make sure uh, we lifted it up in prayer, but uh, Burl was, he had a stroke and as is in the hospital in Ingalls. I don't remember the name just yet. I'm still getting those things uh, situated in my head, but uh, uh, definitely lift up uh, Berlin this time. Uh, and again, let me lift up to you the uh, uh, prayer concerns in the bulletin as I make my way over to Facebook. Oh, excuse me. I will look through. Let me invite you to still use the uh, joys and concern to uh, share with us your joys and concerns. I don't see any just yet. Am I wrong? Uh, do you see any in Zoom? Um, we just lift up the prayers of um, the family of Kathy Weir. Kathy was a former member of the church and passed away this past week. Thank you. In this time, let me invite you to quiet your minds and hearts and go with me before God in prayer. And as you hear the words, Lord, in your mercy, let me encourage you to respond here our prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we offer our thanks, praise, and love through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who gave himself for us. Thank you for your holy church, which you sustain for your powerful life-giving word. Bless your church throughout the world that all your people may celebrate the coming days of Holy Week as we continue through Lent with true faith and devotion. Be especially with those who are preparing their hearts for a new life in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your son, O oh God, accepted the service of Martha, the friendship of Lazarus, and the devotion of Mary. Bless your people everywhere who this day serve you in all different ways. For those who serve in the church as 
lay people and clergy alike in whatever capacity they serve. For those who serve in the home as caregivers to their elders or their juniors, homemakers, extended families. For those who serve in the workplace as employers and employees in what has been extremely fraught conditions for all. For students and school children who serve by learning for the future. For those who volunteer their services in the church and community. For those who offer something as simple as friendship. For those who pray fast and give generously of their time and money. For those who befriend the disadvantaged Bless the service of all your people and assure them that you are well pleased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Speak to the consciences of those who plan evil. Show them that honesty is better than falsehood and that peace is better than violence. Give to all a deep commitment to goodness and mutual well-being. Keep us all from the greed and false compassion that has taken down so many of our siblings in the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your son drew close to Lazarus and raised him from the dead. Be near all people who are themselves close to death and grant them faith in you. Strengthen all who are preparing for the death of a loved one and that they may make the most of the time they have left and help all who work among the dying and live among the dying. The doctors, nursing, staff, chaplains, volunteers who work in all areas where this important work needs done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, may we honor you as Mary honored you with her gift. May we honor you in our lives by honoring all who are in need. May we honor you in our lives by honoring all that you desire of us in our innermost being. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, we pray those words he taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture for today is Romans chapter four, verses 13 to 25. The promise of Abraham and to his descendants that he would inherit the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness that comes from faith. If they inherit because of the law, then faith has no effect and the promise has been canceled. The law brings about wrath, but when there isn't any law, there isn't any violation of the law. That's why the inheritance comes through faith, so that it will be on the basis of God's grace. And that way, the promise is secure for all of Abraham's descendants, not just for those who are related by law, but also for those who are related by the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have appointed you to be the father of many nations. So Abraham is our father in the eyes of God, in whom he had faith, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that don't exist into existence. When it was beyond hope, 
he had faith in the hope that he would become the father of many nations in keeping with the promise of God that God spoke to him. That's how many descendants you will have. Without losing faith, Abraham, who was nearly 100 years old, took into account his own body, which was as good as dead, and Sarah's womb, which was dead. He didn't hesitate with a lack of faith in God's promise, but he grew strong in faith and gave glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. But the scripture that says it was credited to him wasn't written only for Abraham's sake. It was written also for our sake, because it is going to be credited to us too. It will be credited to those of us who have faith in the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over because of our mistakes, and he was raised to meet the requirements of righteousness for us. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Typically, I like to start with an illustration, a bit of an icebreaker, something to get you engaged and involved, or at least make you laugh so that you have good feelings about me taking up the next 15 to 20 minutes of your time. But... This morning, I have an even better story to tell, and it comes right from the passage that Roseanne just shared with you this morning, because it is part of the greatest story ever told. And I wanted to highlight one of the passages that she just shared. Without losing faith, Abraham, nearly 100 years old, took into account his own body, which was as good as dead, and Sarah's womb, which was as good as dead, and I wanted to bring special emphasis to this because it'll be important for it later, but uh, uh, this is important for us. Even before a pandemic, a person who had been serving, existing, living in the church would have said that, gosh, you know, the, the, we used to have how many ever people in the church, and now we have this many people in the church, and that really bums me out. And I saw this passage this week, and, you know, there is nothing beyond God's ability to resurrect. So let's just keep that in mind. And I wanted to bring that little context into this passage. But uh, continuing on, he didn't hesitate with a lack of faith in God's promise, but he grew strong in faith and gave glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. Essentially, Abraham didn't have to do anything but place his faith in the fact that God would do what God said God would do. And God did it. And it was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Now, this is a principle, and this is something I like to bring up when we talk about these things. Biblical principles are different than a particular passage of Scripture that tells us a thing that we either should do or should believe. Principles in the Bible, at least by my own definition, are, are reproducible in many different contexts. So we have Paul saying in the book of Romans to this incredibly diverse audience— that it was faith that was credited to, that, that it was by faith that Christ's righteousness was credited to me and it can be credited to you as well. He goes on to the, uh, to the church in Galatia to say something of the same thing at the end of chapter three, beginning of verse, I'm sorry, end of chapter three, beginning of verse four. Now, if you belong to Christ, indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. If there was ever any doubt, this idea of us being heirs of Abraham is incredibly important because it erases all of our ability or all of our propensity to draw the lines that we do between each other. Faith accredited to us as righteousness makes us heirs. 
Continuing in chapter 4, I'm saying that as long as the heirs are minors, they are no different from slaves, though they really are the owners of everything. However, they are placed under trustees and guardians until the date set by parents. In the same way, when we were minors, we were also enslaved by this world's system. But when the fulfillment of the time came, God sent his son, born through a woman under the law. This was so he could redeem those under the law so that he, we could be adopted. Because you are sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son or daughter. And if you are his child, then you are also an heir through God. That is a fantastic story that we don't tell anymore. That is part of the world's greatest story, and we have pitched it away. Or we have told it poorly, emphasized all of the wrong bits. We are heirs to the same promises God gave Abraham. We, in February of 2021, are heirs to that promise. I can't remember the last tract. I can't remember the last person who shares a uh, a different place on the spectrum of Christian belief than myself that, that didn't have this messed up. We have a great story, and we haven't been telling it well. Because we've been treating our story as garbage, as insufficient. Yeah, we have this faith that has been handed down to us through the millennia. You know what? We we need to add and we need to fix and we need to do all of this. And I'll get to more specifics here in a second. But the problem is we have been treating our story as less than it is. It is so much more than telling us who and who not to hate or harass. And we're all interested in this, and all we're interested in is waving our logo around and baring our teeth to the world. We Christians have not been immune to tribalism that drives wedges between even groups of fellow believers. That's become so much a hallmark of the Christian faith that if you asked people what a specific belief in the Christian faith was, they probably wouldn't be able to tell you. What they would be able to tell you is all of the different ways that the church has messed up for them. And whether or not the church is deserving of that, we are at least at least part of the way responsible for it. Don't get me wrong. Please don't get me wrong. The church has does and will continue to do wonderfully amazing, wonderfully spirit-led, spirit-filled things in the world, necessary things. But you must admit that's not what the world sees when it sees the church, church today, and that's a problem. We will get nowhere. We will continue to be the sect that is continuing, continuing to wither away little by little, or we can be honest with ourselves where our problems lie. In 2018, a politician's spouse wore a jacket emblazoned on the back with a sloppily written phrase which said, I really don't care, do you? It was made only more bizarre by the fact that it was being worn on a visit to, uh, to children being detained at the southern border of the United States. I don't know who the message was intended for, if it was in fact the message at all, however. Does one even want to create ambiguity around where you stand on children being separated from their parents and held at the U.S. border on on that scale, no less? If I may be so bold, I posit the church has been, at the very least, acting like it has been wearing a jacket emblazoned with that phrase on the back. Now, Believer, don't lose heart. That can change. But that's how the world sees us. The church has proven it doesn't care by excusing sexual abuse in its ranks, which isn't just a problem in the pews of our Catholic siblings, by the way. The church has proven it doesn't care by placing more importance on expediency for your tribe and terror rather than conscience informed by the Holy Spirit. 
One of the most watched videos in the world is from the Capitol riots. One in where, along with chanting about hanging Mike Pence and carrying around zip ties with which to capture and detain human beings and beating police officers with flagpoles, rioters shouted, Jesus is Lord, as they violently pushed their way into the building. The church has proven it doesn't care by giving folks like Ted Haggard and Mark Driscoll chance after chance, while so many talented minority and female clergy go overlooked for leadership in the church today. I don't know if you remember Ted Haggard. He was at one point the president of the National Association of Evangelicals, led a large church in Colorado, and was taken down by a, 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 an abuse scandal that included drugs and other illicit activities. HBO did a documentary on him uh, following his, what seemed like a contrite path back to some form of living after having such a collapse. As a Christian, I believe in redemption. I don't know that Ted Haggard should be the pastor of a free Methodist church in Colorado like he is today. Mark Driscoll was the lead pastor of what was essentially a franchise church operation, mainly based on the West Coast. A... a, a a wrath, a just a wrath of, of, of abuse, both of parishioners and staff, led to his ousting, and he's now back in another state, in another church, serving there. Why are we so surprised by how monochromatic and increasingly empty our pews are when we bake these things into the cake? We Christians are to be about rebirth. But if you break the fabric, if, if you break the Fabergé egg, you're not going to eat it. I don't think any of us is ready for just how different the church, small C church, in this nation, in the last 50 years, is going to look, and how quickly it will look that way in the next couple of years. In seminary, we were we were trained to think of the timelines like 10 and 20 years. This pandemic may lead to the closing of something on the lines of seven to 8,000 churches. That will drastically change the landscape of the city. As the saying goes, things will get worse before they get better. There is no specific timeline for how these things will happen, but I just know in my heart of hearts, we have to be prepared. I saw a tweet from a Christian author and thinker, Alan Hirsch, this week that really stuck with me. He said, when Jesus goes to the pub or to the market, he's always looking for what the Father is already doing. And he joins the Father in what he is already doing. This is exactly what we need to do when engaging in any and every context of life. For decades and even through our existence as a thing, the church has often looked to go into an area to impose itself, graft itself on top of any given place. Again, I would posit that I think we have lost the privilege that that is. And when we've lost that privilege, when our skills for evangelism and outreach and things are so poor, it's best to get back to basics. Disciples do what disciples do, and that is go and make other disciples. And, and we don't go, it, it, the, the, church, the new church is not going to look like, oh, hey, I'm a group and we want to go into a community and we're going to start this program that was done here, 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 and here, and it's going to be great. No. We're going to have to politely ask our way back in the door and then prove ourselves by building relationships that go beyond, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Important question, not the only question. I also saw this. The world hasn't been reached or changed by believers, but it has been revolutionized by disciples. Disciples learn the doctrine. Disciples know what they need to know to be a person of faith, the person of faith they desire to be. 
They learn what they need to know about God, maybe seeking wisdom along the way, and then they go do the things disciples do. They do not tear down, they build up. They do not look for who to keep out, but they look for all the ways to let people in. The church needs to prove once again that we care, because whether or not we actually do, the world thinks we don't. And as far as I'm concerned, the buck stops here. We don't get to blame anybody else for our problems. It's our, our problem to fix. We need to go out and do the things we need to do. The church needs to prove the care. Engaging in the things that interest those who seek to re- you seek to reach is a great way to prove that you care. I mean, think about it at work. How do we get to know someone? Break the ice, you know? Did you see bears on Monday night football? Whatever you... The church has to prove that there's a reason to care about the things it holds dear. We have to prove that there's a reason that we do this Lent thing. We have to prove that there's a reason we do this church thing other than just to have a patch that we can wear on our arm that says so. If we don't, we might as well either board up everything or put United Methodist Country Club out on the sign on the front because that's essentially what we're dealing with here. Why? Our story is good. Our story is great. Our story is amazing. Why have we given up learning and engaging? And why have we given that up? The love for our own story has shriveled up to an unrecognizable. The world is saying, I really don't care. We, by many of our actions, have said the same. Jesus invites us to the table to ponder what Lent means in a world where we are seemingly the only ones who care about being the people of the way. And the people of the way do care. Jesus invites us to the table to figure out if care is enough to change. And he's willing to meet you there with the grace of God to do it. Amen. Now let me invite you as we prepare for communion to join me as we sing our communion hymn, I Love You, Lord. a 
sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Jesus invites you to the table. And in the United Methodist Church, we believe that table is open to everyone. Whether or not you are a member of a church, whether or not you are yet a believer, we believe but the grace of God present in the act, in the sacrament of communion is sufficient for salvation. That, that righteousness that we, are, that, that we are given credit for because of Jesus available to us there. And so I invite you to come and grab your elements. Uh, you may have something already. I can give you a second to grab something else, but you probably already have, so we're going to get going. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the cup, I'm sorry, he took the bread, and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you partake in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, and he drank it, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you partake in remembrance of me. And so in, remember, in remembrance of these mighty acts of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks and we pray. Most gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for the gifts of bread and wine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ. And may we be for the world that which you call us to be. Father, bless us in this time. Bless these elements and bless your presence in our lives by your Holy Spirit. We pray these things in your Son's name. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now join me as we sing our closing hymn, Let There Be Peace on Earth.
Absolute permanent right now. We cast a vision forward. That's what this is. Let this be the day we cast this vision forward once again. Because we can. Because the story is good enough. We just have to get out there and tell it. Now, as you leave this place this day, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you all and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.